I feel privileged to extend my warm welcome to Dr. Meera, Dr. Rita, Dr. Shamla Bhattwaj, and Sunita Mahajan from IFSA, and all present here for the webinar Application of Radioisotopes in Healthcare with Emphasis on Radiopharmaceuticals. This is a webinar organized by the Department of Chemistry of Sophia College under the aegis of DBT Star Status in association with the Indian Women Scientists Association. We will begin our program with a short address by the head of the chemistry department, Dr. Prabhashet. Thank you, Shruti. Am I audible? Yes. Am I audible? Okay. Good morning to one and all, and a warm welcome to our IFSA representative who are present over here, Dr. Sunita Mahajan, Chairperson Board of Trustees, Dr. Rita Mukhopadhyay, President, Dr. Lalita Dhareshwar, Immediate Past President, Executive Committee Members, Dr. Shamala Bharadwaj, Dr. Suparna Kamal, Ms. Tripta Tiwari, Dr. Shridupa Mukherjee, and our resource person, Dr. Meera Venkatesh. Welcome to Sophia College. I welcome all those who are present here to Sophia College. The Department of Chemistry believes in all-round development of students. We organize a range of extracurricular and co-curricular activities. Today, we have gathered here for a session on radio pharmaceuticals. Popular Science Lecture is a platform for students to interact with eminent scientists. I'm thankful to IFSA for giving us this opportunity, and I look forward to many more such collaborations in future. Thank you. Over to Shruti. Thank you, Prabha ma'am. Now we'll take a short, uh, we'll take a look at a short presentation about the Indian Women Scientists Association by the president of IFSA, Dr. Rita. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Shruti, and good morning to all <clears throat> the audience. <coughs> the students are our best friends, and that is where we communicate with. I am indeed very honored to be doing this presentation for all of you at this juncture when we have uh, become the new executive committee for the coming two years of Indian Women Scientists Association. And this is the very time when we are also walking into the Golden Jubilee celebrations. Here we see the, we are, Indian Women Scientists Association is a non-government organization, non-political, non-religious. We are here bearing the flag initiated, incepted by very eminent 12 women scientists way in the 1970s. And the building which you see in this picture is our Women Scientist Association's first effort on the grounds in the area of Washi Navi Mumbai in the 1970s, our working women's hostel. And very, I feel very privileged and proud that I'm associated with this association, which during the pandemic time is being able to operate in the safe premises. And we have been housing our uh, hostelites. Maybe the number has gone down because of the pandemic uh, requirements that they moved out from Bombay. But even still today, we have been able to uh, have the hostel up and above working. On the side, you see a glimpse of what I would later refer to as our living garden museum. And today's talk, I will quickly take you all through the progress during the pandemic time. We have been a very large association. We are walking into the Golden Jubilee, I just told you. And it all began with the founder members, the pictures of them, which you see on your screen. And we are proud to have Dr. Sudha Padhi, Madam, and Dr. Lalit Nerurkar, Madam, with us. From the time they all dreamt about this. We are headquartered at Washi, Navi Mumbai. We have 11 branches. Our website address is a request that you all please do visit so that we walk together in the mission 
of taking science to the masses as what we have been doing. On the side is our mandates. And here I have briefly put what is in our constitution. And that is what we abide by. And it's a rock solid constitution uh, giving us the support to go forward. We have research opportunities for women and child welfare. We take the science to the masses through our lectures, seminars, discussions, trainings, workshops, and the latest by internship programs with university and college students. What did we do during the pandemic year? Again, we did not sit idle like all of you teachers have been working very hard. The students are working very hard. We are all becoming savvy on the platforms of virtual modes and that is why we are all speaking from our homes. Uh, this is only a lecture series, the notification which I put up for all of you so that you all can also join these members, uh, these lectures. So in the 2020, when we all got locked up in our houses, uh, we began member enrichment program and we completed 40 such lectures and have now moved on to skill, skill development lectures, which will be commencing from the coming month. We started a science and our life series of lecture once a month that would be held again and eminent people from the society, speakers who would speak for the society and how science enriches and encompasses our life. So we have finished our 21st lecture of science and our life. We have a em member empowerment program that comes under our computer center, which we have at our premises. And this computer committee uh, floated this to empower each other. So we have been conducting online workshops related to becoming efficient and using technology to our best. So we have been holding workshops from how to present a PowerPoint, which I'm doing just now, to how to do our money transfers on online uh, platforms. We have recently begun another activity under the series of new lectures, and that is on wellness, health, and happiness absolutely require for the time when we are all zealing, the whole world is zealing through one and a half year or more for some countries through this pandemic. And this was, big, this was initiated by our uh, health committee, which is uh, operational, not at the moment, but uh, we wish to begin the health uh, committee's activity again, because we have our dental chair, we have our physiotherapist, and these are services which we offer to the society in very nominal, but in the best of manner. I'll go to the next slide, just after the glimpse of the new uh, series of lectures, we have also started to collaborate with other bodies and uh, in the country so that we could make our outreach for, uh, furthered. So, you all are familiar of our popular science lecture. It has been going on for the last past five to six years and has been supported by the Board of uh, Radiations and Nuclear Sciences. This year, during the pandemic, we could bridge with another organization that is the Vigyan Prasar. And here you see one of the uh, we have three projects under them, and this is showing you the project which is called the IFSA VIP Net Science Club. This is supposed to join IFSA into the network of the Vigyan Prasar, which goes far, far away into the grassroots schools as well. So this collaboration has opened up three projects. I will quickly touch upon them. And you see the little kids on their computer. Yeah, very familiar already. Not only the university and college students, even the toddlers are sitting in front of a mobile or a laptop to gain knowledge through media. So we have a program called Each One Teach One, wherein we are going to bring um, students, a student of a higher grade teaching a student of a 
junior grade. And this program is open for all to, from the school, high school to the college and university. Under the same Vigyan Prasar collaborative effort, our nursery school, nursery committee, uh, which also nurtures a very important program. I will touch upon that also later. Uh, this was the Sikshan Shetu, the bridging of the education under the new policies of uh, the government, which was floated again during the COVID times. And with a great effort and efficiency, the team who conducts the early childhood education diploma course, they put together Sikshan Shetu, they took 30 hours of teaching, teachers training, and they designed six modules. And they have, this has been very well accepted by the Vigyan Prasar and will soon be um, spreading through their platforms. After Sikshan Shetu, we, before Sikshan Shetu actually, we had also collaborated with uh, Drishti, another organization of NGO working from Bombay. And that was, that is also a very successful collaboration, which is taking the ECCE program to the forward uh, path. On the side, I here have collaborated, uh, picked up on the slide a few other glimpses. As I said, ECCE is on our 25th year. We have a EVSA scholarship and award body. So students, uh, do please watch out of our website, uh, websites wherever when we uh, advertise for these scholarships and awards. Small may it be, but it is a very important one and we have been able to uh, support girl child through their studies from 12th standard to the university. We have this skill development program which was initiated this year, 2021 wherein we started to empower our own staff who otherwise could not be uh, coming to work with their normal uh, skill and work. So we tried to uplift their skills into the next level. And it was a successful program currently, off and on when the pandemic touches us heavy, we stop. And when the pandemic is in its slow, we begin and re-begin. Uh, the last one on this slide is the IFSA internship program. Again, something which we initiated in 2021. And we have successfully interacted with the over 50 students of uh, SIES, uh, um, SIES uh, management program. And currently, we are going through the internship with 54 students from the Jai Hind College, uh, which will be commencing uh, at the end of this month. And these are giving us wide opportunities to nurture science at its basic and being able to do the mandate's best uh, work that we are interacting one-to-one. -one. We are motivating the future scientists. We are bringing in very relevant environment or science or uh, computers a span is wide and we are open to the internships for any subject. May it also be engineering because our member strength is over 2000 and our branch strength, we have 11 branches. Then you can understand what is the bad in our membership strength of IWSA. Soon we should be on the LinkedIn so that uh, anybody could see us and uh, we can interact. Here is a slide which is from the very latest, um, again, to only tell you all that we did not sit back idle at home. We cannot. And here are the glimpse of, we did a very, it, we did an absolute online Science Day celebration by uh, conducting a exhibition and competition. We interacted with school children for that and we, could successfully also bring them online to showcase their projects. Our health center, health care has already begun the series of lectures as you see a poster there. We celebrated two uh, digital uh, world environment day celebrations with all of our branches. And this is one of the posters from this year's 5th June celebrations. On your left, you see the Flame University intern 
who interned with us for one month and how well she has produced the outcome of uh, lesson plans for uh, standard fifth children. So we have several programs and what is on the blue on the right here, that's what is coming up on 26th of this month that from the internship program, one of the projects was looking at mangrove restoration and that team took forward the saplings which they got from the Godridge uh, Vicroli Mangrove Park. They nurtured and grew them up into stable saplings. And on Monday, we shall be going actually on ground to plant them at the seashore of Washi. So with this, yes, I have taken more than five minutes. I wanted to only touch upon that we have a holistic thinking. Our founders gave that wisdom and we are carrying forward. And these are some glimpses of the green initiatives. And again, the left is the second Teju Mui uh, solar panel, which was installed. And it is still under process during the pandemic. And this is our old solar heater. And another green initiative, I want to end with this, was our biodiversity garden, which we transformed and we wish to inaugurate this year late during the winters, IVSA Learning Garden Living Museum, the first one to be on the soils of Navi Mumbai. And this is only a glimpse of how well we have been, our members have put in their expertise to bring the biodiversity and represent in a museum fashion what plants mean or biodiversity means for sustenance in environment and how the garden becomes the source of learning and knowledge sharing. So we call, also call it the garden-based learning program. And finally, you know we have the website. We, you know we are wanting to come into LinkedIn to connect with everyone. We also have our newsletter which is a quarterly publication. And this time, and since few past few years, uh, we have been environment compliant and we are publishing it as a e-journal. We have a message to be paperless. We have a message to be not, not calling waste a waste, but a resource. So, Nothing goes out of our premises. They are maximally recycled and resourced. And we are trying to be as much paperless as possible. And with these messages, we want to only strengthen the bridge and we want to make more network bridges. So come, do join us as members, student members, as faculty members, and let's take our mandates forward together. Thank you very much. And now the forum is for the purpose of the talk. And I know the speakers and the students are waiting anxiously. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Rita Ma'am, for the lovely presentation on IFSA. Now I would like to call upon Sharmin to introduce our guest speaker to the audience. Thank you, Shruti. A very good morning to everyone. I feel very honored to introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Meera Venkatesh. Ma'am graduated in chemistry from the Bombay University and thereafter underwent one year training in nuclear science at BARC. She then joined as a researcher there in the field of radioisotopes and radio pharmaceuticals. She worked there for 34 years until 2011. During this period, she grew from a junior researcher to the lead of radio pharmaceutical division at BARC and concurrently served as the senior general manager at the board of radiation and isotope technology. From 2011 to 2019, she worked at IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, as the director of the Division of Physical and Chemical Sciences in the Department of Nuclear Applications. She has authored over 200 publications in international journals and books. 
and is an editor of two international journals. During 1992 to 94, she was engaged as postdoctoral research associate at University of Missouri, USA. She served as a, pro a visiting professor there in 1999. She has been an honorary professor in chemical and biological sciences at Homi Bapa National Institute and a guide at Mumbai University. She has guided 13 PhD students in the areas of her expertise and is passionate about promoting peaceful application of nuclear technologies. For her contribution in radiation and radioisotope related technologies, she received awards for excellence from the Indian Nuclear Society and from the Department of Atomic Energy India. We are very pri privileged to have you here with us, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharmeen, for introducing our guest speaker, Dr. Meera Venkatesh, to us. And uh, thank you for accepting our invitation, ma'am. We feel honored to have you with us this morning. Before we proceed with the webinar, I'd like to inform my dear participants that uh, you can keep your mics on mute and videos off to experience the talk in the best way possible. If you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat box during the talk. Your queries will be addressed at the end of the talk. Now, I would like to call upon Dr. Meera Venkatesh to apprise us of the applications of radioisotopes on healthcare. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to young students, as uh, Rita also mentioned. Uh, thanks to IRSA as well as Sophia College for this opportunity uh, to talk to the next generation. Uh, so I'm sharing my screen now, and uh, because the time is, um, uh, you know, limited, uh, I would like to uh, uh, sort of uh, go through uh, how I'm going to uh, address. Like, for example, um, the talk itself says application of radioisotopes in healthcare with emphasis on radiopharmaceuticals. The topics are very vast and especially students who are from chemistry, biology, sciences, I heard. Uh, for you, there are so many things that could be of interest. So I'm not going to describe everything at all. It's just going to be like an overview. It's just a, uh, like a, um, a trailer for you to see what's available. And then if you're interested, you could always, uh, uh, you know, get to know that those areas much better. So, uh, so my contents will be like, concept of radiation, perhaps all of you who are listening to this already know, but I would like to start it with some, you know, like a base, like a foundation from which I will uh, go on to focus on radiopharmaceuticals. These are, and again, I'm not going to read everything that's there on my slide. Um, you can read if it is fast, then later, if necessary, you can always ask uh, Sophia College, I can share my slides. So um, when we talk of radiation, um, as people know that they are uh, mostly from radioactive nucleus, that's what we were, we are now going to speak about, but they can also be machine produced. And almost a century ago, more than a century ago, in fact, a um, lot of pioneering work, wonderful work, something which is even today when I read it, it amazes me, uh, where uh, made discoveries, uh, innovative things, so uh, you could call the first half of last century as a golden era when we had so many input from different angles which made this radiation application a possibility and which has grown in so much um, to help the humans. So when we talk of radiation, it's energetic emissions, as you know, and it could be uh, from radioactive nucleus, which is already present in the universe or maybe artificially made. And again, I presume all of you know the radiations as alpha, beta, which are particulate or gamma rays, which are just photons, electromagnetic radiation. So if you look at what is, what is special, number one is they have energy. They have varying energies, different isotopes have, diff uh, different variations have different energies. Then the second thing is they are transient. As they lose their energy, they cannot go on producing energy. Once they uh, emit their energy, they become some other nuclei which is not radioactive. And so this is non-permanent. The concept of half-life is important for the application. So what are the applications are related either to the isotopic measurement
lose, they weaken, they lose their energy. So different radiations have different powers, different penetrating capabilities. And these changes and their own attenuation are the basis of their enormous uses, um, which touch our daily life. Here, I'm just going to quickly run you through to the different aspects of how these are used. Number one, I said they are energetic. So they give out, so they can be measured and we can, they provide information and they like spice, I said, and they can be used as what's known as tracers, whether it is uh, some leakage in a pipe or something inside the body. The second one, because they are energetic again, they are also able to cause changes in living as well as inanimate things. They can kill uh, virus, bacteria, cancer cells. They can alter materials. They can make polymers. They can break polymers. So, so many attributes just because they have that energy uh, to do these changes. So they can also create defects. So they are being, they can, they can have applications in several, several fields. So the third aspect, we saw that they can be measured. They can cause changes. The third aspect is as they lose their energy, they also provide information about what they are passing through, just like your X-rays. X-ray, everybody knows X-ray about the X-ray um, imaging. Now everybody knows also about CT imaging. So similarly, radiation, different types of radiations can provide information about the matter they pass through. So it, it need not be only humans or uh, machines. It can also be in a museum. So these are the three different ways in which uh, radiation has been used um, primarily. And uh, so which is why they have also been uh, used in different aspects. Like uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about healthcare, but it is not just the healthcare. You have a huge number of uh, areas, food, agriculture, industry. It could be uh, water uh, management. It is... Um, uh, environment, artifacts, culture and heritage, and several miscellaneous things like, you know, heat energy source or uh, fire detectors, coloration of gems, etc. So coming to the healthcare applications, um, radiations can, already you have um, heard about that they can be tracers. So the same way they can be tracers in, um, for diagnosis of diseases, they can be used for therapy because they have the deleterious effect to kill the cells. They can be the same diagnostic imaging can be used in post-treatment monitoring and radiation because they are able to kill germs and bacteria and viruses. They can be used in sterilization or irradiation of blood or tissue before, before transfusion. So these are the primary healthcare applications. And uh, they're also used uh, nowadays in a big way in drug research and producing new materials um, through radiation processing. But what we will see um, uh, now today is only about radiopharmaceuticals. Uh, I just wanted to slightly dive, um, you know, take a deviation and mention radiation in therapy because this is also very, um, uh, what to say, touching the human lives because they can, uh, they can be used for therapy, particularly cancer therapy. Many of you perhaps already know about the teletherapies and here I have just put a, a machine which was made in Bhabha Atomic Research Center. This is the kind of uh, machine where the radiation is used for killing the cells. There is what is known as brachytherapy where uh, the radiation source is put inside the tumor just like here in the case of breast tumor or a throat one, this child's eye tumor, and that is a, a brachytherapy. The last one, which I have mentioned here, is the nuclear medicine, where it is um, used inside the body, like a, uh, like a pharmaceutical, used as a radiopharmaceutical. Now, when I talked about radiotheses in healthcare, although I will be focusing on radiopharmaceuticals, I could not leave out this uh, method, which is known as radioimmunoassay, it's a Nobel Prize winning technology, 1977 Nobel Prize to Dr. Yas Rosen in Yalu and Burson for devising such a beautiful method in which a biological sample can be taken to measure the hormones and, uh, uh, you know, markers or whatever small amounts of molecules. All of you are uh, chemistry and biology students, nanomolar 
you know what it is. Such a small amount, such a small concentration, not just the concentration, but it is present in blood or biological fluids, which have billions of other molecules. So in that situation to measure those hormones was a big, a huge task. And most of, before this, uh, this kind of immunoassays came into being, uh, people used to be going to very experienced doctor, doctors to get their uh, diagnosis because it was mostly out of the experience and uh, deduction looking at things, not measuring the hormone itself. But now things have changed. It is not just the hormones for thyroid disorders, or, um, but also several tumor markers are me me measured using immunoassay. Earlier, it used to be radioisotope radio tracer-based assays. Now it has been um, you know, replaced with other, uh, uh, other tracers like enzymes or fluorescent or clemiluminescent. But I won't just, um, dwell on this much more, but this, this was one of the um, uh, methods which completely changed the way endocrinology and tumor uh, detection and follow-up was looked at. Now, finally, coming to radiopharmaceuticals. So where, is, where are they used? Nuclear medicine uses radiopharmaceuticals. This is the lifeline for nuclear medicine, which are radio-labeled molecules, which are employed inside the body. They can be employed either for diagnosis or for treatment, but they have to reach the organ or lesion of interest, either to en enable imaging or to uh, cause uh, damage and destroy the cells there. So what is important is it's not just the radionuclide, but also the biochemical properties of the molecule that govern how a radiopharmaceutical behaves inside the body. So as I said, it has a radionuclide and a targeting molecule. This was not always the case in the beginning. We will go through the little bit of quickly run through how uh, radiopharmaceuticals developed in a, at a little later stage. But um, the important thing at this current time to note is uh, the biomolecule should be targeting and uh, the radionuclide should be doing its job of either uh, giving out where it is or destroying the cells. So this, this kind of radiopharmaceutical gives functional as well as anatomical information because where it goes, it shows how big, how small the lesion or the organ is. And also it, say, it shows that this molecule is biologically functioning. And in the case of therapy, it is uh, because of the molecular affinity for the lesion that it causes therapy, not, not just like shooting the gun and uh, destroying the, uh, the cancer. So when it comes to diagnostic nuclear medicine, uh, we have, uh, we administer a radiopharmaceutical into the body. It can be used for looking at anatomy or function of the organs or looking at tumors, the say shape, position, and uh, how, how it is growing or decreasing if they take multiple images. And primarily it is used in cancer diagnosis, both for diagnosis as well as treatment monitoring and follow-up. So primarily this has been used, diagnostic nuclear medicine has been used in cardiology and oncology. And I have given some statistics here based on the 2018 fact sheet, which was there in the website. And uh, the numbers, as all of us know, it's all in millions. And other areas like neurology, infections, liver, kidney diseases, et cetera, also benefit from diagnostic nuclear medicine. There is also drug research, uh, which as I mentioned, uh, can benefit or not can, it is being used. Uh, nuclear medicine is being used to develop drugs and test them, how, efficacy, how efficient they are. So I mentioned about organs, uh, anatomy function here. I have just put, um, a picture of uh, thyroid. You can see that this is a normal thyroid. It has taken up iodine, which always goes to the thyroid, uh, iodide as iodide. And here you see a abnormal thyroid, which doesn't. So this kind of image speaks million words to the doctors. It speaks even more. Even for uh, a uh, non-professional in nuclear medicine like me, it is so evident something is wrong. So in case of different organs, the shape, size, abnormalities, to look at goiters and uh, nodules, tumors, etc., and also to look at dynamic functioning. This is static imaging, just one picture. But dynamic imaging is like how it is going, how it is going through the heart or the liver or the kidneys, and whether it's uh, properly functioning or not can be measured using nuclear medicine uh, images. And of course, tumors, as I mentioned, 
already is a huge part of nuclear medicine is being used in cancer uh, uh, diagnosis also and especially follow up and seeing whether the patient is doing well i will uh, be giving you few pictures just to make the point i know that our time is limited to 60 minutes i would like to finish within that um, so please bear with me if i am a little quick in rushing through some things so here i will just uh, mention about what isotopes just radionuclides you can't put any radionuclide into the radio pharmaceutical it depends on what we want to do so if it is diagnostic it has to come out of the body and give you an image so it has to be imageable photons like gamma rays or it could be also um, you know positron emitter which after annihilation will give two photons in opposite direction um, another uh, digression here uh, i know that people are from different backgrounds who may be listening if something is beyond your uh, scope or beyond your previous the thing please ignore uh, i am just going on talking and whatever is uh, within your ambit and within your uh, receptive signal you please take and we can always have dialogues later if necessary so here i have mentioned a few uh, gamma emitting new uh, radio nuclides and positron emitters which are now ruling the roost we will also see a few others later just as a list just to have an a feeling how how vast this field is and it's not just um, the isotopes the advances in imaging techniques you know that ct how ct has grown in the past 20 25 30 years uh, the tomographic image possibility uh, and also the fusion of different images have changed the uh, nuclear medicine practice quite a lot so we have single photon emission computed tomography or positron emission computed tomography which are now the most widely used diagnostic uh, modes of imaging so here i am showing a few scans this is skeletal scan as it is written it's a phosphonate which always goes to the bone um so here you see a normal person doesn't not too much of activity you see a person uh, two people uh, they are with uh, one is with a prostate cancer and the other one i think is with a breast cancer whatever it has metastasized into the skeleton you can see where all it has metastasized this gives a very quick information clear information Uh, with uh, with uh, the quantitative information to the doctor treating doctor so that he or she can treat in an appropriate way so um, it's not just one molecule for one uh, organ or something or one for everything no it depends on what organ it is and uh, it could also same organ could be um, uh, one to find out the function maybe many problems are possible so multiple tests are necessary and multiple radio pharmaceuticals are used usually for the right diagnosis here it's a heart uh, scan it's a dynamic scan showing the various regions so the computation the uh, the the, uh, the hardware software and isotopes and the molecules they all have come together to produce uh, this kind of possibility where one can see how the heart is functioning not just look at it but also calculate what is the fraction what is whether uh, ejection fraction is okay or not whether a myocardium is uh, viable or not and things like that so this is about um liver you see uh, i have just shown just to have a feel a normal liver how it looks and when there is an atresia how the image shows there is some problem similarly this is brain this is used uh, using a, a positron emitter fluorine 18 a normal pet of the brain with the glucose and a person with alzheimers reduced glucose uptake this is with epilepsy it has to be taken during epilepsy so that they know which parts are affected so this is uh, uh, i mentioned about positron emission tomography this has revolutionized the um, nuclear medicine practice because of the wonderful images that you can get so that the doctors if they have to perform surgery know so well you know you can even have the images rotating like this so that it's almost like looking into the body so this is the beauty and wonderful um, you know possibilities with diagnostic radio pharmaceuticals now with therapy we mentioned about what what isotopes for the diagnosis that radiation have to come out but it's just the opposite for therapy they have to go and kill the cells when it comes to external therapy you need something that can first of all go inside but when it comes to internal therapy like radio radio pharmaceuticals they have to be particle emitters 
which will have effect in a, either within a nuclear, some cells, few cells, hundred cells, things like that. Very short range, so that they don't irradiate good good parts of the uh, body. So where the therapy part of nuclear medicine, uh, which we call as therapeutic nuclear medicine, has um, of course there is a radiopharmaceutical uh, which is in uh, administered for therapeutic effect, and you have high linear energy transferring particulate radiations that are used. It could, it may not be just beta or al alpha. They could also be OJ or conversion electrons, which are very good for therapy within short ranges. Here, just a cartoon showing different ranges. And uh, from the long time back onwards, the iodine and phosphorus 32 have been used for therapy. Now, uh, therapeutic nuclear medicine is very well established. In fact, that was the first one. Before diagnosis, uh, radioisotopes were used for therapy. In fact, that was out of curiosity, right? After they could isolate any radioisotope, they started using it for therapy. I won't, I won't go there now, but um, uh, it's almost from uh, uh, 80 years now that radioiodine has been used for thyroid cancer, also to hyperthyroidism, which is not a cancer, but over-functioning of thyroid. It's, but therapy is generally for uh, cancers and also may not be therapy but palliation of pain like you saw that um, skeletal metastasis it could be very very painful and keep make the person's life miserable so at least to improve the quality of the life pain palliation can be achieved using radiopharmaceuticals so i mentioned about non-cancerous ailments like hypothyroidism also sinoviotesis like uh, it's it's in the joints when there is a problem they, one can use radio radiopharmaceuticals. So in the past decades, I would say at least uh, three decades now, it has grown enormously and has become billions of dollar business, which attracts attention from different, different uh, uh, industries. So it is growing in uh, variety and uh, extent ambit also. And one of the main reasons is because of the kind of molecules that can be used to reach the lesion which has to be treated. So I have just mentioned several um, kinds of uh, tumors which are being currently treated using radiopharmaceuticals. Um, and there are also several radioisotopes, apart from that iodine-131 and uh, phosphorus-32, which I showed, which was used 80 years ago. Now, there is a huge number of isotopes which are being used for uh, therapy. And with very good success, it's just uh, unbelievable the way in which uh, things have moved with the therapy. And now the personalized therapy, which means it's not that, okay, iodine-131 is good for thyroid cancer, not the same amount will be given to everybody because they will link diagnosis and therapy together. And the word named as theragnostics has been formed, although the concept has been there from long. But in this case, the same biomolecule, which is labeled once, with a one nucleide for finding out where the problem is, how big it is, whether the molecule goes to the lesion at all or not through diagnostic imaging, which is followed by another radionuclide, which is for therapy, so that the molecule is the same and it will go and attack the same place. And the doctor can precisely decide how much, how much of radiation to be given. So this, uh, this is like following therapy through imaging. It is helpful in accurate dosimetry, et cetera, et cetera. So it's personalized uh, treatment therapy. So again, just like for diagnosis, I like to show some images, a quick perception. So here, a patient with liver metastasis, such a huge amount of uh, uh, accumulation, treated with a therapeutic uh, radiopharmaceutical, Dota Tate, it's a peptide. And over time, you can see that the liver has uh, cleared. With, from the metastasis. This is another one, prostate cancer, metastasis in the, in, into the uh, skeleton. The imaging is done with a diagnostic radiopharmaceutical, gallium-68, positron emission tomography, um, uh, radiopharmaceutical, which is binding to a, what is known as prostate-specific membrane antigen. It, and it showed so much of disease. And after several sittings, now, it is showing the uh, decrease. So this, this kind, it's also very gratifying because you are able to see how it works. This is alpha therapy. Alpha has very short range. 20 years ago, we would never have thought alpha could be used for therapy internally, but 
Now all the, the kind of uh, technologies available has made it possible. And you see here a patient with the uh, same prostate cancer uh, metastasis treated with actinium after three treatments of the four, thrice here and one more, almost perfectly clear. So uh, it is, it is uh, very gratifying when it works. Um, so it has, uh, practice has seen phenomenal growth due to the various inventions, innovations. One is, as I mentioned about uh, the technology, detectors, image processing, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not reading them again. Uh, also the fusion imaging, because they can get wonderful images when you fuse two different technologies to get, the, uh, get, to, look at a, uh, get to look at an organ. And also the growth in the biological molecules that are available. Cancer biology has always been extremely interesting and growing, and so many new things are coming out with the antibodies, tumor-specific targeting molecules, et cetera, and they are feeding into the development of radiopharmaceuticals. And the other angle is production of isotopes. What could not be produced uh, 20 years ago are now being attempted using high uh, capacity accelerators, et cetera, and radio labeling techniques are also improving. So overall, it has been growth from multiple angles leading to the growth of nuclear medicine. Here I have just put a cartoon showing you how one cell can be approached. So many varieties, so many ways. Uh, you, if you look at it, you can just somehow get into the cell if you know which road, which door to open with what key. Uh, here I have just put some uh, pictures of pioneers who, who made, you know, made the leaps possible in nuclear medicine. Cameras on one side, isotope de development, and something called uh, nuclear radionuclear generator so that people can have isotopes of very short life in their own labs. And of course, monoclonal antibodies I mentioned, Nobel Prize winning technology, specific peptides, all these things, they made what, I, what is known as technetium 99M, a workhorse of nuclear medicine. Almost 40 million studies per year are carried out globally. And this fluorine 18 glucose for positron emission tomography, uh, this estimate is a very big guesstimate. I spoke to a few people, it ranges between 10 to 20 million. You can take it as 20 million perhaps now. This is a person who also was pioneering this uh, since uh, last 10, 15 years. He's no more now. But a lot of, lot of uh, input through their innovations and advances as well as isotope transportations have made the growth possible. So if we look at the path taken by radionuclides, so I had mentioned about phosphorus and iodine already. And over the, over the decades, uh, production of isotopes has grown because of variety of, uh, as I mentioned about accelerated, et cetera. And this, I have just mentioned some key points here, key, uh, what to say, where there have been paradigm shifts, uh, taking you from one point to another in the growth of nuclear medicine. So I had mentioned about technetium. I can't um, leave it without uh, slightly adding a little bit more because it is still the largest used, uh, I mean, uh, use the maximum for diagnostic imaging and almost whole body you can measure with different radiopharmaceuticals. It continues to be the most used diagnostic radiopharmaceutical. This was a paradigm shift in 70s, but somewhere around 2010, there was a shortage and that led to new thinking and new developments in nuclear medicine. Second was, Somewhere around 2000, 90s to 2000, fluorine 18. This, uh, this molecule, FDG, some of you might have even heard, oh, they did FDG PET. This is, uh, PET is positron emission tomography to get a tomographic image. This is the maximum used uh, PET imaging agent. It was named molecule of the millennium um, in 2000. Next came therapy focus. About it, I have already mentioned. There is, uh, there is continued uh, efforts to have different isotopes and different molecules for personalized, very, um, uh, what to say, effective therapy. So if you look at the various isotopes, again, I'm not going to elaborate, just look at the numbers. 
um, the ones in uh, ones in bold they are the maximum used but there are so many others waiting in line to be used whenever uh, it is possible or wherever it is possible and these pairs are of importance because as i said they give uh, information about the for diagnostics and they also enable treatment this is a quick glance at our periodic table and you can see some of the regions are the elements where uh, maximum isotopes have been used. The whole of lanthanides, it's wonderful to use them because you can label them with biomolecules very easily. I'll come to the labeling part just a little bit later, but this is just to impress upon you. It's not all, it, if you take all these um, um, noble gases, you can't link them, it's not chemically uh, active, but xenon is used. Uh, as gas itself for lung imaging. So it all, uh, there are odd cases, but most of the others are metallic nucleides, which can be linked to some other biomolecule. Here I have shown the decay scheme of actinium 227 and 225, just to impress how difficult it is to um, separate as well as how complex it is to calculate what happens when it is introduced into the body. Just to, just to give a pointer at the complexity, but also to show that this has been one and people are using these very, very successfully. Now, that was isotopes. Now, when you look at how uh, a radiopharmaceutical acts, it is uh, most of the time in multiple modes. Uh, you know, both the radionuclide and labeled molecule play important roles and uh, charge the three dimensional structure, lipophilicity, stereochemistry, everything plays a part. So the radiopharmaceuticals, when we, when we have to study separately as a science, it is very vast. One may say whether it is essential one or non-essential, I'll just show some glimpses of them, um, not to overwhelm you, but just to say the, to show you the complexities involved when we talk of radiopharmaceuticals. So uh, if you look at the evolution, initially, long, long ago, 1940s, uh, 50s, it was simple molecules which were used uh, for targeting iodide very easy straight away goes to thyroid that was what it was used for phosphorus phosphate goes to bone marrow it was used for that later it became simple biochemicals organic molecules like rose bengal hippuron they were labeled and used where they had an atom which was a which was originally there it had iodine so it was made into a radioactive iodine so these were used as radiopharmaceuticals then came the era when any molecule which goes, which has a targeting property, we will try to radio label them and look at how it behaves. So that's how a lot of agents started to be developed for kidney uh, functioning, uh, liver functioning, etc. So here the question of hydrophilicity, lipophilicity, etc., are important when people start developing molecules to suit the needs that we want. So uh, it was uh, simple from molecules tuned to the I have here suit the needs. I have here just given the uh, images or the structures of few radiopharmaceutical. Not going to explain. This is called this is technetium 99 M labeled molecule where there are where it is complex with six molecules of isobutyl isonitrile. This is plus one charge, positively charged. This will behave as a radiopharmaceutical to image heart only if the technetium is there not just this one. So this is called the essential radiopharmaceutical. Similarly here, technetium, which is uh, bound to ethylene cysteine dimer. It has got two uh, ethylene cysteine uh, attached to it, complex. This will behave as a molecule to um, uh, you know, image brain only if it is in this complex form. But there are other molecules, as I mentioned earlier, a biomolecule and a, what is known as a chelate, with claw-like thing. You are the chemistry students, definitely you know what is chelate. These claws will hold on to the radio metal at the center and they will take, the biomolecule will take the whole thing into the um, target region. So that those are the various strategies, various thinkings uh, which we are going. So the chemical structure is very important. The chemical sequence, uh, like for example, I mentioned about renal, uh, renal images. For a tubular function, they found that this kind of a structure takes it to the tubular mechanism. So they had one which was originally working, but they replaced with technetium, technetium radiopharmaceutical, 
which will mimic to some extent and which were good. These are the ones which are now used for renal tubular agents. So similarly, the chemical sequence is important in many, many imaging. So I, this is just to show one example in each case, charge. As most of you know from biology or even otherwise, you know that charged complexes clear through kidneys. Plus one charged ions go to heart, like plus uh, potassium plus one has a mechanism in our um, heart. And that's why uh, plus one charged uh, complexes have been used in heart imaging. Neutral complex is needed for crossing the blood brain barrier and lipophilic complexes to go through hepatobiliary system. So the molecules are attuned, they are, uh, they are adjusted to um, have the right charge so that they can do the right function. Stereochemistry, again, very important for binding to specific uh, places. Here, this is a um, uh, succinic acid dimer, which is, uh, which is a kidney agent, but the same succinic acid when the technetium is in a different oxidation state, this is in plus three, this is in plus five. This one is a tumor imaging agent. You see it's the same technetium, same DMSA, but just the stereochemistry is different because it is in two different oxidation stages and it can be behaving entirely in a different way. So these are the uh, nuances, these are the intricacies that one uh, can appreciate when, uh, when, one, when, when we look at radiopharmaceuticals also when we look at how to develop them. So the other one is, of course, the complex biological mechanisms, which I already alluded to earlier by using a lot of target specific molecules like antibodies, peptides, et cetera. So the advances in biosciences have helped a lot in this and um, they have enabled us to come out with a huge number of uh, radiopharmaceuticals that can have potential use. Now, this is another view. Uh, I'm not going to um, elaborate here, this is just to say that it is not the way they evolved, but you can also look at how the targeting strategies can be different. Sometimes it is necessary to physically trap, for example, lungs or liver cancer treatment, colloids are used. And when it comes to perfusion, just something which will go with the blood. So these are, this is another way to look at how the targeting of radiopharmaceuticals can be looked. And this is important for people who are looking to work in these areas for development. So it is, uh, it is good um, if we know how a certain organ can be approached by mimicking uh, another molecule with the radioisotope, either for imaging or for um, therapy. So this I already mentioned that uh, one molecule can be used for uh, different, uh, uh, I mean, well, the, the same organ may need different uh, molecules for being measuring the, their different parameters. So one is of course the heart because it is uh, to find out whether it is normal or there is an infarct or there is an ischemia. There are a lot of, uh, lot of radiopharmaceuticals for that with one of them as gold standard, which is just thallium plus one, which mimics potassium plus one. But there is also metabolic function, which is important in heart. And in that case, none of these will help. You have to have a, a fatty acid label, which can do the job. So it is uh, understanding the biochemistry of the organ to study it. So that is used for uh, finding out um, the def defects or uh, diagnosing the uh, problems with those organs. So this is about brain imaging. Primarily, it is used in uh, old age related disorders, seizures, etc. And uh, I mentioned about blood brain barrier crossing, a lot of other uh, characteristics which are needed. And here I have just lift, uh, listed some of the uh, mainly the ones which are used. But what I would like you to, uh, well, I like to draw the attention is this molecule, ethylene cysteine dimer, which I showed earlier. It is, it's all good, but it doesn't work in rats and mice. When they did the experiments, it didn't work. It only works in primates and above. So there is also some more excitement. The persons who developed did not give up when they did not find good results with rats and uh, mice. So that's also a nice thing because never lose hope. Maybe you, are, you have to look further and deeper and see how best to make things work. And this one here, HNPAO, um, this is a molecule which, go, which is used in the brain imaging. It's a, it is a um, lipophilic molecule, uh, no charge, but once it goes into the cell, it, uh, it gets hydrolyzed and gets trapped. And here only the DL isomers work, not the meso. 
So there is a lot of um, intricacies in the development and in the testing and also to look never never leave any stone unturned kind of so though, though that is the kind of um, thinking going behind the development of radio pharmaceuticals so here this i think i already showed you once um, let's move on may i check how much how many minutes i have more 20 minutes okay so so this is uh, this is again just a, a cartoon which i took from um, uh, nap uh, publication but it's very nicely showing how that one brain has so many receptors which can be tackled with so many molecules to get different kinds of information so this brain is a very interesting organ uh, although it may not be like cancers where people are uh, dying to immediately find something that will work immediately but it is very interesting it's also very important to find out the mechanism especially find out whether such a drug is working or not this is very useful some person who is having a schizophrenia given some medicine we have to find out how whether it has helped or not can be beautifully done using these kind of nuclear medicine imaging and oncology is the as i already mentioned it's the maximum uh, uh, used uh, i mean the, the the field in which radio pharmaceuticals are used maximum so here also another cartoon you see so many ways of approaching the tumor cell there can be antibodies to the surface antigen using the peptides for which that particular tumor may have receptors etc 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 so these are all these strategies are being uh, looked into different cancers different mechanisms may work and that's what is being tapped into so i have already mentioned this a couple of times that a huge impact due to the targeting molecules have been there and not just not just in the lab it has to be produced in kilograms if it is antibodies you know that monoclonal antibodies which won the nobel prize in 80s it has a great, great effect a lot of antibodies have been explored but to make them in huge reactors huge bioreactors it needs a different kind of setup and that's what has happened over the years and these have enormously helped the treatment modalities including through nuclear medicine here this is just a, a table to show you so many antibodies which have been exp um, explored in um, cancer therapy but uh, and also explored uh, through for uh, nuclear medicine many of them are all in uh, clinical trials they are all used in limited stay limited amounts in some clinic somewhere but these two are uh, these two are commercially available so this is primarily only for the non hodgkins lymphoma where the receptor is cd20 but uh, 45 uh, antibodies have been approved by fda we use that as a standard it uh, most of the world follows what fda has said so lot of antibodies are also waiting to be approved after radio labeling for uh, therapy of some tumor so primarily right now we have only the uh, b cell lymphomas non hodgkins which have been approved because they were the ones which were begun in the beginning here there is uh, this is just another cartoon showing antibodies yes very good but they are so huge 150000 even if it is igg so people have also looked at engineering the fragments so that only the binding portion can we make it small so that it can go around the body quickly so that it doesn't get uh, uh, broken in between so that the nuclei radio nuclei which is being carried doesn't decay away etc etc so there is also a huge um, number of bio i mean immunochemistry uh, people who are studying how to engineer the antibodies so that you can have small molecules equally capable of targeting but quickly maneuvering through the body peptides have had a huge impact also here i have listed lot of um, uh, cancers where peptide therapy is used just peptides are used because you can also block the um, uh, you know if it is um, antagonist if it is going to prevent the cells from um, multiplying it's a good therapy but when you use it just unlabeled if you require a lot and that the issues are different which i am not talking but if you can radio label 
it's beautiful because it just goes there and not just sits there, but it kills that cell and many cells around. So that is something um, very, very uh, rewarding. And uh, already peptide therapy for certain cancers are very um, um, efficiently used, very widely used in the whole world. So if we, uh, we looked at myomolecules, so the other part of it is also evolution due to the availability of radionuclides, which I mentioned, because not just reactors, which were the original ways of producing, but huge cyclotrons are coming up all around the world to produce isotopes, which, uh, which are short-lived, also which don't, don't have the other problems associated with the re reactors. Huge reactors are huge and it's very expensive to run them. But also on the other hand, automation, processing and radio synthesis, you just press a button, you get the material out. This kind of innovations through automation and um, electronics has helped in uh, progress of radio pharmaceutical quite a lot. And there are a lot of um, uh, accelerator produced isotopes now used for therapy as well as for uh, um, diagnosis. Separation technology has also helped a lot. Uh, as a Baba Atomic Research Center person, I have been very um, impressed and very happy to work with people from different fields, separation chemists, to find out new ways of separating isotopes. Here I have, uh, again, the, those who are not from radio chemistry field, it's okay, you don't have to feel overwhelmed, but just to show that there, is, there are two reactions to produce the same beautiful isotope, lutetium-177. One is just direct irradiation of its uh, precursor. And it's got a few beautiful absorption coefficient. Very nice, you will get a good amount. But the other one is using an indirect route, but you will avoid any impurity here. So people are following all these methods. So there are advantages, disadvantages with each. And um, it is just that the radionuclides and their separation technology has played a big role in what is being used right now in radio pharmaceutical. Um, radio labeling strategies also have been uh, continuously evolving. People have used microwaves, people have used different kinds of uh, um, uh, reaction uh, possibilities to make things work. And uh, also new, uh, this new uh, agents we already spoke about, chelating moiety, the linker. So this, the whole thing, radio pharmaceutical is broken into uh, different parts like this part, the green one, the blue one, the uh, receptor part, which is in the tumor. So everything can be engineered a little bit here and there so that you have the uh, best quality of radio pharmaceutical, best efficiency. So uh, the chemistry is very important here. Here I'm just putting a collage of a lot of uh, molecules which have been very successfully used in preparation of uh, radio uh, pharmaceuticals by putting the metal center there. Just hold on to the metal center. This is gallium, this, this is capable of putting the copper there, technetium here. So no, not going to elaborate, but just to show you the enormity of the work uh, that goes beyond uh, development of these. So what are the needs and the current trends in development of radio pharmaceuticals? If you see um, one, definitely we need high specific quick targeting with high efficient affinity, quick clearance. If it is diagnostic, we don't want it to stay there forever and irradiate. Minimal non-target tissue binding, and major areas continue to be oncology, neurology, cardiology, et cetera, but infection imaging is a big thing for India. It will be very good if we can have a good infection imaging agent, especially for things like TB. And the current trends are people are start using short-lived isotopes, exploring new isotope generator systems are very useful in this because you can get your isotope right in the laboratory. New biomolecules, targeted therapy using alphas, et cetera. These are the trends. So how uh, is the journey of radio pharmaceutical from bench to bedside? If you look, the important stages are, um, you have radionuclide production, processing, et cetera, that's on one hand, the choice of the biomolecule, which is the other important aspect, then putting them together, radiochemistry, chemistry, purification, which is separation, et cetera, evaluation. It's not just physics, physical evaluation, biological evaluation, testing in animals and imaging in animals, et cetera, clinical trials, which involves the clinicians and the setup where this can be done. And finally, if everything is fantastic, then kit, what can be used by the hospitals 
or uh, the preparator, the nuclear pharmacy in an easy way. Because if it is, if you tell that you have to have such a huge setup and do things for two days, it's not going to attract. So all these are the important aspects to uh, for a radio pharmaceuticals to be taken from a laboratory to the clinic. So there is a huge set of specialties uh, when we develop and launch a new radio pharmaceuticals, which I have listed here. I'm not going to read them out um, for the paucity of time. Let me see. It's 1014. Okay. Um, so, and I believe as uh, particularly the students who are at the verge of now going ahead and choosing some specialty, maybe, even if it is not the same, but you will know that any of these specialities can feed into development and the deployment of radio pharmaceuticals um, through uh, being a part of the whole uh, picture. So it's multidisciplinary and it needs seamless working, collaborations, cooperations, deep involvement and professionalism. And uh, I think when we look at uh, the bigger picture of saving, uh, at least serving some uh, patients, it, is, it can be very satisfying. So with that note, um, I would like to end my uh, quick overview of radio pharmaceuticals and uh, the importance of radio nuclear medicine here. And I would like to thank, um, first of all, all of you, of course, to, for uh, listening, coming and listening, but my teachers and mentors who have always inspired me and uh, paved my uh, path, Department of Atomic Energy and all my colleagues for all the discussions, etc and International Atomic Energy, which gave me a, an opportunity to look at global scenarios and broaden my visions. And of course, my close ones, family, friends, and colleagues for all the enthusiasm, support, and warmth, and all of you for listening. And thank you very much. With that, I stop. Thank you. Hello? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we were enraptured by hearing you talk about uh, the evolution and journey of radio pharmaceuticals, biotracers, and the nuclear medicines and radioisotope imaging and therapy. Thank you so much uh, for giving us such an interesting talk, ma'am. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. So now, if the audience has any questions, I'm sure or uh, you'll be pleased to answer them. The sure. floor is now open for the question and answer session. Uh, if any of you have any questions, you may either type it in the chat box or raise your hand so that we can unmute you. I see one question here already from uh, uh, Ms. Tarla Nandedkar. Um, what are the side effects of diagnosis or treatment? So diagnosis usually uh, doesn't have side effects because even though they are called radio pharmaceuticals, the amount which is used is, in, is very, very low, nanomolar quantities. It just goes into the sea, but the radioactive isotope is able to give you the information, diagnostic, I'm saying. So generally, that is one of the criteria for getting a radio pharmaceutical approved for diagnosis. It should not have any side effect at all. But I won't say the same for the therapeutic. Uh, for example, I had mentioned about... Um, Yttrium-90 labeled um, anti-CD20, I think rituximab, um, one of the um, antibodies for therapy. Um, so these, um, these um, big molecules labeled with therapeutic radionuclides, they are injected into the body for killing the cells. The amounts which are, amount of molecule itself may not be too much. Again, not as much as the drugs we take for various um, ailments. But the amount of radiation is not very small. It, is, it has to kill the cell. So it has to be taken uh, and then put on that uh, target to kill those targets. Along with that, there is always a collateral damage around. But there is also sometimes, um, you know, if it is given intravenous, it has to travel through the veins. There's so much of radioactivity traveling through the veins into the uh, organ, which is why the antibodies, they want to make it small, uh, antibodies in the sense, antibody fragments, so that it doesn't take too much time going around the body and irradiating things. So for therapy, it is important, targeting should be quick. So in those cases, people have found uh, side effects like uh, hardening of uh, veins into which it was injected. But they also come up with things like after injection, they also flush the whole thing out of the body 
through giving a lot of diuretics, giving things which will push it out of the kidney. So it is taken care, but you can't say there is no side effect at all. Whereas I can say for diagnostic imaging, hardly anything, absolutely no side effects. For the therapeutic, depends on what it is, how much it is, etc. but there can be. But in some cases, like for example, thyroid, if it is thyroid uh, cancer or hyperthyroidism, which is treated with iodine 131, it goes straight quickly into thyroid, stays only in the thyroid. There is not uh, too much side effect, but it just, uh, of course, it burns the whole thyroid. So the person has to take uh, thyroxine tablets afterwards continuously. But I don't know if it is going to be called thyroid effect, but uh, that's, that's the thing. Uh, is chemotherapy a better option over radiotherapy in cancer treatment? See, if you talk to um, uh, therapy doctors, there is no one answer for uh, uh, treatment. In fact, even I know that if my one of my close relatives or somebody gets ill and if there is a, um, something very serious, I will not leave anything unexplored. The same is the case for cancer therapy. The doctor decides it will be sometimes a multiple therapy, surgery followed by radiation as well as chemo. So often chemo and radiation are going along together. And sometimes if necessary, surgery, breast cancers. Many times the breast cancer, the nodule is taken out, surgery is done. Then they give a radiation to the part so that there is no left um, cell which will now again cause the cancer. And they also give chemo so that it is internally, wherever it is, it's taken care of. So it is not one against another, but the decision is the doctor's because it depends on the cancer, the extent to which it is spread and even individual. Individuals respond differently to different uh, drugs for the same cancer. So I, I cannot give a one answer for this, but um, it, is, um, um, it is multiple things can be given. So next question. What is proton therapy for the cancer treatment? Yes, uh, one minute. Before that, there is one more. Which course can we choose after BSc chemistry if you want to pursue further education in fields related? So there are, uh, if you go to Baba Atomic Research Center sites, there you can also see uh, radiation physics and uh, radiation protection courses. They are also related. But um, with a master's, uh, one may have to do a master's in organic, organometallic uh, uh, type of things and then uh, go on also for, uh, um, or on the other side, biology area where you can pursue uh, um, research in these. But it's not so easy to just say in one line, like what should pursue after BSc? And it, is, uh, it has to be developed. So you go step by step, MSc maybe, and then work. And then one of the options is to join uh, Baba Atomic Research Center, but that's not the only option. There are also options around the world. There are options even in India, very other, uh, many other places where uh, this could be seen. You can go to the site of Society of Nuclear Medicine India and find also some options. They will have, um, they have some options for people to go into the um, fields related to radioactive elements. Okay, what's proton therapy? Yes, um, I did not touch. Which was uh, uh, which gives gamma rays, uh, which produce which sells uh, gamma rays into the patient's body. It has to be accessible. Uh, uh, what to say? It has to be accessible for irradiation. This was one of the oldest way of therapy. Later came uh, what is known as LINAC, linear accelerators, where electrons could be accelerated, and even electrons can themselves be used for therapy or it can be converted into photons, X-rays, and used for therapy. So they are, they are the ones which are now maximum used for teletherapy around the world. Also gamma rays, but also LINAC is uh, uh, gaining popularity for various reasons. Now, proton therapy is a subset, which is a very, um, what to say, it is a sophisticated one, I would say, but it is also extremely expensive because uh, the protons have to be accelerated to very high energies 
hundreds of mega electron volts and they are in a very small narrow uh, beam they are pushed into the body where the lesion is now the proton the beauty is it doesn't interact until it is its energy is reached a certain um, amount and then it deposits all its energy into the tumor so this area where it deposits the energy is known as a bragg peak it it is it just goes into the body like a, a knife and only gives the energy at the point and that depth which it can travel depends on the energy of the proton which is why if a c if a tumor is deep seated you need a very high energy proton and if it is superficial maybe one can do with much less energy protons nevertheless proton uh, uh, accelerating protons in mega electron volt itself is a much more expensive business than just using radioactive nuclei and but it is supposed to be much more um, clean in the sense it doesn't disturb on the way it just deposits all its energy at the small volume after it reaches its where it is bragg peak is and that is why it is very popular for brain tumors for tumors which are accessible uh, within a few millimeters of the skin these are these have been uh, shown to be very uh, very uh, efficient what is this that's is that it doesn't usage of radioisotopes lead to radiation and be harmful ha huh. see use of radiation a radioisotope not everything has to be harmful you know that is why just like this is the easiest example is your surgical knife unless the surgeon uses a surgical knife how will he treat he or she take out the cancer i mean whatever is not wanted so you have to one has to use it with caution the right way and with the right uh, experience and expertise so it should not be like it's not like buying in the this thing and we will use it uh, in the kitchen no it has to be used with caution and the right uh, way and that is why it's a speciality it is uh, harmful if it is uh, not properly used and because it is harmful it is useful in killing the cancer cells i think I that's know, how can we can we use radio isotopes in case of covid 19 uh, no i am so sorry that it is not possible <laughs> because covid 19 Uh, as you all know is a viral problem which dip, uh, it it manifests in so many different ways if you say that this uh, there is something which is a fair this has got covid 19 virus in this packet can you use yes i can use radiation and kill all those viruses but the patients who are affected uh, for diagnosis or for treatment no at least not that i know if it is some material which has to be cleared then now you also know that even steam can perhaps kill but there are uh, there are bacteria and viruses which don't get killed with uh, steam or ordinary things they can be killed with radiation heavy radiation they just get destroyed so for that purpose even covid 19 will die if it is there in a package or something if it goes through radiation but if it is for diagnosing people with uh, covid infection or for treatment of people uh, i'm sorry there is no and and radio pharmaceutical and nuclear medicine will not have answer for everything it's a speciality it's used in special cases for wherever it is useful it has been very gratifying so we cannot extend that everywhere it can be used and in covid unfortunately no thank you ma'am mira if i could just come in hmm? please uh, just for the question which was posed uh, there is a there are some scientific papers publishing getting published during the pandemic times so we all will wait for those sciences to be authenticated even later but what i am hinting upon is that giving low dose radiation to the chest hmm. as like diagnostic x rays hmm. people even in our town i heard i mean in our nanavati hospital here had tried that that they felt as if that low dose exposure mm -hmm. allowed virus clearance but as i said word of caution new research being done but in the context of the discussion i thought i should mention yeah. and if the students certainly certainly you should in fact i also got one um, um uh, what is it called um, 
not just uh, you mentioned about chest um, uh, uh, exposure to chest radiation there mm -hmm. was another one about uh, low dose homeostasis or what is it uh, homeostasis yes yeah. so that kind of uh, that is also being looked at in the us but again, with um, two opposite people still discussing, so I don't want to bring that. But what you say um, is uh, could be of interest. You are right, even though it may not be like you know, it's not like a specific uh, targeted treatment. No, what no. you're saying is, if there is some infection and if it is going to die with this ray, just like how people are saying, take steam inhalation, you will feel better. Instead, this may be much more effective. I, I would uh, yeah. narrow it down to that. Yes, certainly, certainly. But it is, it's possible that that kind of, uh, uh, you know, quick uh, one uh, treatment, maybe like a sanitization kind of thing could, could be helpful. Mm. I do not know. Yeah, we can wait. Yeah. Mm. So I, I should not put, throw cold water totally. I should say that it is still under um, being uh, no, looked at and <laughs> maybe... Maybe something will come out. And if it comes out, it's really good, yeah. But since we discussed this, maybe here is where you can also, again, enlighten us. That in the COVID times, we know that HRCT became okay. very popular and in some instances became overused because even low infection people were sent through that. Hmm. I, I want to know, and if you can tell us all that, how safe that was. I personally personally feel it is safe because it is high radiation, quick time, but to hear it from you would be very soothing. Yeah, HRCT <laughs> is being done. Yeah, I, I, yeah the, see, I'm not an expert, times, first of all, I will say that I'm not yeah. an expert on that, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, like you said, just reading and uh, the curiosity and uh, see, because there are, even for CT itself, there are uh, um, arguments whether CT is required for all kinds of uh, um, uh, what to say, internal visualization or not, because it, the amount mm. of dose it gives is far higher than an ordinary x-ray or much, much more than nuclear medicine scanning also. So people who are a little conservative, they are worried that this is being used indiscriminately and you may be thinking that it is immediately solving some problem, but it may cause some other uh, problems. So in my opinion, if it is some deadly thing like this COVID, perhaps it is uh, worth uh, uh, going through because uh, people take the CT for back pain and head uh, injury, et cetera, et cetera. So this is much more, uh, what is it? this is also at least equally concerning. So I would also think like you saying that, okay, if HRCT helps, why not try that? Yeah. But if it is for anything which is manageable with, uh, um, which is not as deadly as COVID and which is manageable with other, EMA, if uh, other kind of treatment, I would say we should not overly lean towards CT because it's also indiscriminate uses giving too much of those for which you will not know the uh, effect immediately. It could be a long-term effect in terms of tumors and things like that, which comes in the patient. Thank you so much. And there is one more. Can we fuse radionuclide with monoclonal antibodies to have cell-targeted killing and normal cells won't be harmed? Yeah, th that, is, that is the idea behind... Uh, uh, using monoclonal radioactive monoclonal antibodies, um, but you know uh, the antibodies and the radionuclide they are just bound together. They don't talk to each other. It doesn't say that only after monoclonal anti uh, antibody will reach the target, the radionuclide will give the radiation. No, the radionuclide will go on giving its radiation, and the new monoclonal antibody which will take its own sweet time to reach the target. So on the way, it is possible that normal cells can be killed. So only thing is after attaching to the cell, that uh, that uh, nuclide will only have effect on that cell or around the cells because it depends on what nuclide it is. If it is alpha, it is a short distance, but if it's a beta with high energy, it will kill hundreds of cells around. So not necessarily everything is normal, but in tumors, you know that they are all together. But if it is, that is why, um, it is not access, uh, amenable for every tumor and every kind of thing. It has to be, uh, it has to be reachable. It has to be localizing there. Then it is uh, possible to treat it with radiation. Dr. Meera, may I ask a small question? Please. Uh, yes. First of all, uh, congratulations for the excellent presentation. I'm sure we've all benefited, especially the students. They would have all been augmented with the, you know, the way the slides and your excellent oration. 
Uh, now, my, my slight question, which I like would like to ask is, uh, what are what is your take on the prospects and challenges of using uh, low dose radiation therapy for COVID patients? Um, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, thank you. Thank you for all your kind words. It was also equally a pleasure for me, like, um, uh, uh, this one said, you know, uh, uh, it is an, it is very nice to talk to the students. We look forward, they are all our ambassadors and they are our future. So it has been a pleasure talking. So thanks for your words. Uh, coming to your low dose radiation for COVID. This is what Rita just now also alluded to that there are studies going on. Maybe, maybe it has some effect because um, if it is, you know, in general, um, irradiating and killing something which is all whichever is um, easily east. susceptible those what things is to east 15 what is that what did you say hello ma'am i think it's somebody else not okay <laughs> okay uh, so uh, uh, coming to the question on uh, low dose irradiation uh, this is something similar to what uh, dr vita said sometime back so I think it is interesting, if, but I don't have any um, uh, authentic data. Maybe I can uh, talk to some of my radiation um, uh, physics uh, people who are in hospitals. Uh, Rita also mentioned about Nanavati. So I'll, I can find out if uh, what, what way it is going and whether it is very promising, et cetera. But if it is promising uh, in patients to reduce their uh, load, viral load and severity, I think it's it's not a bad idea at all. It's like a irradiation of the chest, wherever there is the possibility now. Right now, people find us that leave lungs getting overwhelmed and then problems occurring. So if that can help, uh, I think it's a good, good. But again, whether it will work in everybody, whether it will work in all these the delta variation, that variation, all those things, they are all nitty gritties, which I have no idea. But it's an interesting thing. and. I believe it can work in some, some at least, definitely. Thank you so much. Uh, ma'am wanted to ask, hello, ma'am. Yes, please. Wanted to ask that whether uh, isotopes have been used in zero survey for uh, antibodies. Have, been, have we uh, done any use of isotopes in zero survey, ma'am, which is yeah. being conducted now? Any? I am not available, aware of this. What exactly do you mean by that? Zero survey? Uh, zero survey of antibodies, which is being done, ma'am, which is uh, for finding out the antibodies which are present because of COVID. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. Has uh, anything been done using isotopes, ma'am? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, how will it help? I am not able to comprehend how will that help? Because unless you have um, Tra radioactive right? labeled um, uh, the, the, the variants, yeah. And using, then see which are the ones binding. Yes, yes, ma'am. But using RIA or something, ma'am, radio. Yeah. See, the problem with the radio immunoassay or other immunoassays is the development and authentication is a long process. Okay. It's not like, okay, okay, COVID is already here for one and a half years almost now. But uh, maybe it requires a day and night work towards looking at how immunoassay can help in uh, looking at it. Of course, the, the one, the antibody assays which are being done, I think they are all ELISAs, that is the ELI enzyme linked the immunoassays. But uh, because there are other traces available, enzymes and fluorescent and chemiluminescent markers, which don't have the cautionary notes associated with the radioisotopes, people generally nowadays go to the other uh, markers. And which is okay, because the radioisotopes need careful handling and it can contaminate. Maybe the same is not true with, uh, maybe like, it is true that enzymes, fluorescent markers, chemiluminescent markers don't have the same kind of um, cautionary thing attached. They could be, uh, if they are teratogenic or uh, you know carcinogenic molecules, that's a different thing, but handling them is uh, requires less approvals than handling radioactivity. So in my knowledge, I don't think it is. Thank you, ma'am. I think that's it. I don't see any more questions. Looks like we've covered all their queries. Are there any more questions? Uh, 
I think we've covered all of the questions. Thank you, ma'am, for answering all of them. And um, dear participants, uh, please uh, spend some time to fill the feedback form which is posted in the chat box by the end of the session. Now, I would like to call upon Ikra to offer the official vote of thanks. Thank you, Shruti. So, on behalf of the Department of Chemistry of Sapphire College, I would like to take this occasion to thank IFSA for collaborating with us for such a wonderful event. And a sincere thank you to our principal, Dr. Sister Ananda Amrit Mahal and being with us today and sharing her immense knowledge with us. Last but not the least, thank you. Without you, this event would have not been possible. Thank you. Have a lovely day. And please fill the feedback form. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to join us in the webinar, uh, Dr. Meera, Dr. Rita, Dr. Shamla, and Sunita ma'am, uh, all the staff members, all the teachers and students. Have a great weekend. Stay home and stay safe. Stay safe. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you also. Also, all of you have a nice weekend and wish you all a very bright future. Thank you, Meera. And Thank thanks you. to Sophia College. Dr. Thank you, Prabhashi Thank you, and Thank you Sophia people. Thank you, ma'am. For inviting me. And uh, Meera, it was a wonderful lecture. They enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, the students can leave now. Please fill up the feedback form. Sirisha, please stop recording.